Hey, I'm back. Good morning. As I told you, Adam will be back next week. I know y'all look so disappointed that you got me this morning. Now you get to see what your students suffer through every week. I'm <laughs> just kidding. So today's message is called Hangover. Now, some of you in here might be feeling a little hangover this morning, and that's okay. That's okay, because I got a few things for you. So up here, I got some hangover remedies. Um, some people say, hey, you need a little Gatorade, right? A little hydration, kick all that out, get you jump started in the morning. But you might want to take them with a little Tylenol, the pill that stops the beating in your head. It's always a perfect mix. Then somebody, for some reason, thought tomato juice would be a great idea. Um, I don't know if you're supposed to mix this with something or just drink it by itself, but I don't think it sounds too tasty. But this is my favorite one of all, and uh, I try to eat these every day because they're just amazing. But bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches. I guess the grease and the bacon and the bread soaks it all up, you know, makes everything a little better. So this one is a little cold, but I like to give food out at Dan Vegas because everybody likes food. Maybe it's just me and I'm just fat and I really like food. But um, So did anybody miss breakfast this morning? Courtney did. Courtney did? <laughs> All right, whoa, you guys are excited. Sorry about that in the back. That was quick. I, just, <laughs> I had to throw that one out. Enjoy your bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. Uh, so I figured I'd bring a little bit up there, up here to you guys today. Um, so there is one final one, and it's going to kind of be what we talk on today. There's one final one that I couldn't get up here. Um, the whole reason is Adam wasn't here, and he usually pushes the envelope. And I don't know if I've been here long enough to do that yet, so I figured I would leave it at home um, or just not buy it. But there is another one that says, bite the dog that bit you. Um, so I guess if it was Crown, you get up and chug a little Crown and walk on about it, or if it was Bud Light. So, but this is Union, right? We are messy and jacked up. I figured I would need about everything in the ABC store and then half of the beer cooler at Sheets to kind of encase all of us. So I figured I might as well leave that at home. Uh, I mean, um, not buy it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Y'all going to think it's kids, pastors, and alcoholic. Um, I figured I'd just leave that at home. But that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So if today, maybe you got up this morning and bit the dog that bit you last night, it's okay. We're glad you're here. We're going to talk about it a little bit and uh, move on into things. So uh, there's all types of hangovers. Uh, most of the ones that we know about are alcohol hangovers, right? Those are the ones that usually get us. Uh, but there's a bunch of different types of hangovers. Maybe you have a hangover this year from how much money you spent at Christmas. Oh, Lord, what did I do? I have maxed out some stuff, stretched my pockets a little too thin, and how am I going to recover? Yeah, that's a bad one. Maybe your hangover is, I ate too much of Christmas hangover. Put on an extra 10 pounds, feel like you're carrying 100 around. That's what I do every week. Congratulations. Welcome to my life. Um... Maybe it's <clears throat> your past. You're dealing with things from your past that you just can't let go of, that you haven't been able to shake off yet. Maybe it's uh, you still having a fight from Christmas with your wife because your in-laws came into town and they don't really like you and you don't really like them, and there's that. So there's that type of hangover. Uh, there's a type of hangover of being over-emotional, you know, stimulized. Like, there's been a ton of people at your house, and you're an introvert, and you have to, like, just become somebody that you're not, shake a little bit, drink a lot of coffee, and talk to everybody. But whatever your hangover may be today, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're stuck on, we're going to talk about how to bite the dog that bit you how to kick it for good, how to get past it, how to move on, how to get that toxin, those toxins out of us and get them away from us so that we can move forward going into 2017 looking at it from a different perspective. 
Let's uh, pray real quick, and then we'll jump into the scripture. Dear God, as we open up your word, Lord, I pray that you would make it jump off the page. God, that you would bring it to life in the only the way that you can. God, that your spirit would fill this room. And that it would just take control and take over. God, I pray for understanding and knowledge of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to start in Philippians 3, verse 12 through 16. Um, if you do not have a Bible and would like one, they are um, outside at the info desk. Make sure you stop and get one. If you do have your Bible, go ahead and open it up, or you can look at it on the screens. Or you can take your phone out and turn your Bible on. There is no phone police around here. I won't send Alan to get you because you have your phone out. All right, I'm going to read off the screen. I lost my place. Wait a minute. Hold up. Oh, okay, I lost my place. I'm going to read off the screen. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So, let's do a quick recap. Up until this point, Paul is talking to the Philippians about who he was, what he's done, where he's been, the mistakes that he made, and, and where exactly he has been in life. And how he needs, how he has changed. So he starts verse twelve with saying, with saying that basically, I keep pushing on, I keep striving forward, I keep going ahead, and that I haven't already obtained this, but I'm I'm working to it, and I keep pressing on. And then in thirteen. He reiterates it again. He's like, hey, I'm working toward, toward it, but I'm not there yet. I haven't fully grasped it. I haven't fully got my hands on it. But to make sure that I don't get sidetracked and I stay on track, the one thing that I do do is I forget what's behind me. He basically is saying, hey, I'm still pushing. I'm pushing with everything I got because that's what it takes every day. It's a constant push. It's a constant move, looking ahead at what God's already done for me, and I just got to go get it. I'm going to give it everything I got because I want to be like him so much that I, will, I want to die for the cause just like he did. That's what Paul is saying. So I'm going to give it everything I got, but I can't continue to do that if I'm always looking over my shoulder at my past. See, when we're hung over, the, the worst thing that we can do is look over our shoulders. Whatever it is that we're hung over by, if we're turning around looking at it and still remembering it and still letting it grab our attention, then we're not past it. Then we haven't let it go. Our first point to get past the hangover and to get past this this year Stop spending time dwelling on the past. See, how many of you want to be honest, because I do this too, I let it drag me down. How many of you want to be honest and say that a lot of times you spend more time thinking about how you messed up and how you screwed up and why it ain't good enough instead of thinking about how God's already taken care of it and threw it out for you? See, we get hung up in that cycle. And see, what happens is when you're looking over your shoulder, and I used this analogy in the second service, how many of you have ever been driving down the road, your kids are in the back seat, and this has happened to me as a child, so I, I, this is how I know. Mine's not big enough to smack yet. 
So, um, <laughs> driving down the road, and we were playing in a back seat, and we're elbowing each other, and Mom was like, if y'all don't stop, I'm going to pull this car over. Donna Dickens ain't never pulling a car over. She's just going to hit you from the front seat. Um, but how many of you have been driving down the road, and your kids are in the back seat, and they're driving you nuts? And you turn around to say something to them, and you turn around and look, and you're halfway off the side of the road, and you're sliding trying to bring it back. See? You took your eyes off of what was in front of you, and it almost cost you everything. See, it's a whole lot harder when we're speeding because when we're running toward that goal, we want to get there as fast as we can. That's just who we are, to pull it back. See, when we take our eyes off of the prize, we get derailed. And every time we get derailed, it's a little bit harder to get back on the track because just who we are and how we take things and if we're focusing on that we go well I failed again I guess I'm not good enough you start to believe the lies so you gotta stop focusing and dwelling on the past I want you to look at uh, throw 15 up for me I'm sorry, 14. Okay, 15, I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. All of us then who are mature should take such view of things. And if, some, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So 15, he says, so I, I'm telling you what to do daily because this is what I do. And I don't think there's anybody in here that if we're looking at it from a human perspective, because let's just be honest, we look at what other people do to justify what we do. It's part of our flesh. If we're looking at it from a human perspective, there's nobody in here that was worse than Paul. Nobody. You don't hold a candle to him. So if he's looking at you going... Hey, the one thing that I do daily is that I focus on this and I forget what's behind me. And all of you should have this view. And if you don't, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask God that he would make it clear to you so that you could understand this perspective. And then in 16, he kind of, to me it's, it's so funny because when I read it, I was like, man, I could just hear it. It's, it's almost like it's like, all right, so come on now. I've told you all this, and I got you to this point. Now let's be real. Stop looking at your brother and your sister next to you. Stop judging what you do to what they do and where they're at and where they're moving in their walk with Christ and start worrying about yourself. Let us be real is basically what he's saying. Only live up to what you have attained. Where are you at? You don't need to focus on somebody else because that will get you derailed. Just like looking to the back, looking side to side will get you derailed quick because you're working off of what somebody else has already done and where they've been. You need to look at yourself and you need to say, okay, this is how far I've gotten. I have this many more steps to go. I'm going to continue walking. Don't worry about John, Jally, and Sally, and Sue who are 25 steps ahead of you. They've been walking a little more than you have. They've been taking steps a little further. Let us be real about where we are at because the only thing that ever helps us is when we are real and honest about what we're really struggling with and where we're really at in life. You continue trying to play the game of, oh, I'm not really struggling. Keep lying to yourself. It's not going to help you. It's not going to move you forward. You have to be real before you can make progress. I, wanna, I want you to turn with me to Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and I'm going to give you my last two points. It says, Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Don't be anxious about anything. Just quit focusing on our past. Stop being anxious. Take everything to God. 
See, the word petition kind of hit me and stuck out to me. Petition. To make a formal request to an authority. To make or present a formal request to an authority. Sounds pretty important, right? Here's the question I have. There's no bigger authority on earth than God and His Son, Jesus Christ. None whatsoever. They are the same. Greatest authority on earth. Greatest authority in the universe. Can you go talk to the President of the United States anytime you want to? That's supposed to be a big authority, right? There is an authority greater than that that wants to talk to you. That Paul just tells us that he wants you to bring everything you have to him. He already knows about it. He's just waiting on you to come drop it at his feet. Come bring it to him and lay it at his feet. See, point two is you got to stop focusing on things out of your control. See, I made a mistake this week. I read this, and I was all excited to show it to my wife because I thought she was going to learn something. Um, And that was my mistake. So I ran in there, and I'm like, honey, honey, look at this. Courtney, look, look at this verse. You need to read this. She said, oh, I do, do I? I said, okay, never mind. You know everything. I'm going to go pray for you and me. So if you decide to show your wife a verse like that, just be careful. She might try to kill you. Just warning, all right? But no, seriously, why do we focus on things outside of our control? We all do it. How many of you focus on things outside of your control constantly? Let's be honest. Come on. Come on. All right. Now my second question. How many of you ever driven a car 70 mile an hour down a highway? Some of y'all are lying. We are in church. Um, How many of you, now let's see how many I got, have ever decided that the best thing to do at 70 mile an hour if you needed to stop really quick was open up the door and flintstone that mug. <laughs> Nobody? I thought that'd be a great idea, right? That's exactly what focusing on things are out of your control like. Trying to stop a car speeding down the highway by sticking your feet out the door. Oh, you're going to stop, all right. You're just going to be spinning around in a median and your car is going to be gone. It's like holding on to something that we cannot control. My grandfather used to have this bulldog, and this mug was an idiot. And I can say that because he he really was. You know how he died? He grabbed a hold of a truck bumper and let it drag him down the road at 55 mile an hour for two and a half miles before he let go. He'd done it five times before it finally killed him. You would think after the first time you would let it go. Why are you being that bulldog? It will eventually wear you out and eventually put you in an early grave. Why do we stress over stuff that we can't control when we've already heard that our Father is waiting for us to bring Him to Him and lay Him at His feet? Matter of fact, he's calling you, telling you to. And you just ain't picking up the phone. Verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds, and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer and supplication, and what follows from this? The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. It will keep you from thinking about that garbage. It will continue to develop and grow you. And that happens when we stop fearing alone time. See, alone time is good. A lot of us are focusing on things that we can't control, and they're wrapped up in their past, so they don't want to be alone because then they have to actually deal with it. Guess what? It never goes away unless you deal with it. If you don't unwrap the box and give it to God and let him take control of it once and for all, it's always going to be in your closet. 
It's always going to be like that scary clown that somebody gave you that you don't have a heart to throw away. Every time you open a door, it's going to jump out. You've got to finally put it to bed. You've got to let it go. You've got to cut that tie. Fearing alone time gets us to a point where we stop spending time with God. We stop offering up our, our prayers to Him. We stop picking up those things that hurt us. See, with alone time, it's good. It allows us to spend time with God. It allows us to pray, recharge, and develop plans and goals. See, because when we spend time with God, He starts to build back into us. He starts to grow us. He starts to, to make us into who He wants us to be. When we don't do that, we start running the other direction. See, this message really hit me hard when I started praying over it and what I was going to use. And as I started praying over it, God said, well, you have some experience in this, so why don't you talk to them about what you do? And I struggle with alone time gotten a lot better at letting go of things that I can't control I still struggle with it at times this is not something you do once and it's over this is a daily process how many of you have kids that have ever fallen or taken a dive or maybe you yourself took a dive as a child scuffed up your knees your little elbows maybe a little face and you took off running to your mama or to your daddy because that's where the comfort was. They picked you up. And they brushed you off. And they cleaned up your little cuts. Put a little band-aid on it. And usually what do you do with your child that's, that's hurt, that's upset? You grab them by a little face. You wipe their little eyes. Wipe their little runny nose. And you look them in the eyes and you go, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. You're probably going to have a bunch more like this, but you learn from this one not to do it again. They're just like us. And guess what? We probably did it four or five more times. But every time, Mama was right there, Daddy was right there. She brushed you off, picked you up, and let you know that it was going to be okay. And that's what he wants to do today. See, when I was struggling and I was in the ditch and I was ready to quit because I was tired and I couldn't fight anymore, because I had opened every door I knew to open, talked to every doctor I knew, talked to, if it was, it had an ologist on the end of it, I was trying to talk to him. If there was something I could take to try to help, I was trying to take it. And I'd talk to people around me, and I'd go, well, what are you doing? Because you look happy, but you tell me you struggle with the same things. Well, I drink a lot. I knew I didn't want to go down that road. Well, I smoke a lot of pot, and I knew I didn't want to go down that road. And then the other answer was, well, I just forget about it. But every day I wake up, and it's worse. I knew I didn't want to go down that road, so I tried every other door. And when I was laying in that metaphorical ditch, and I was ready to quit and give up, and I was looking at it going, well, this is how it's going to end. I'm going to take it. Because I can't fight anymore. I don't have the strength to move on. I don't have the strength to get up anymore. I just want to quit. I want it to be over. I don't want to face it anymore. A voice started to come out of my heart and start to talk to me. And he said, what about me? What about me? When are you going to give me a chance? When are you going to let me fix it? See, we all walk around with the ace of spades in our pocket that we can pull out and end the card game at any time. No matter how far you're down, that ace of spades will get you out every time. But why do we always use it last? 
See, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks his heart, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So my question for you today is, what does your heart say you are? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it toxic to you? Is it toxic to others? Or is it good for others? Is it good for you? See, the Bible, this is a tricky statement because the Bible says that a heart can be wicked. And it can tell you things that are not of God. And it can spew things that are not of God. See, the thing that that helped me is I knew who God was, but I had run away from him. I thought he was the last person I needed to go to because I had made so many mistakes that I didn't think he wanted to see me anymore. But see, the thing is that we always miss is that our Heavenly Father always wants us to come back home. He doesn't care how far you've made it out or how far you've ran or what you've done or what you've messed up. He always is ready to pick you up and tell you, okay, you made a mistake again. We're going to try to work on it and not do it again. But let me brush you off. It's okay. Let me wipe your tears. You know, Dylan said earlier, no matter how far you run from God, when you turn around, he's right there. Because he's just waiting for you to come back. See, whatever your hangover is right now, maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your salvation. Maybe you haven't fully given it to God yet. Maybe it's something in your life that you keep struggling with that you don't know how to get past. Maybe it's an unwillingness to commit, to go all in for God and give Him everything you got because you're scared of what He might call you to do. Today is the day that we change that. This is the the verse that rang out from my heart. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. See, when I was out of options and all I heard was your trash, your garbage, you threw it all away. You had a shot, but you gave it away because you wanted something else. You decided to make a plan. You ran away. He can't use you anymore. End it and save yourself the sorrow. End it and save yourself the pain. Quit fighting for something that isn't there anymore. You're a jerk to everybody you know. Nobody wants to be around you, so get on with it. finally pulled out that last card. Jeremiah 29, 11 rang out from within my heart. And I knew I wasn't alone anymore. And something hit me. Maybe you like to build engines. Maybe you like to build transmissions. Maybe you like to work on cars. Maybe you like to read books. Maybe you're fascinated with plays or or instruments or, or whatever it may be. If you wanted to know everything about that something, who would you go to? Who would you go see? You would go see the creator, the author, the writer, the developer. That's who you would go talk to, right? So why is it when we're struggling and we can't get out of our own way and we can't stay on track and we can't move forward and and we continue to to crush everything we have and destroy it. Why is it that we always go to our author and our creator last? Why do we ask him last? See, he knows every fiber of your being. He knows everything that that makes you tick. He knows how to make you work. Everything about you. But yet you ask him last. So this year, going into 2017, why don't we get real? Why don't we start making resolutions that aren't self-indulgence? 
that aren't pushing us to be something that we're never going to be? Why do we need to make resolutions that we're going to quit on next week? Stand to your feet with me. Let's make a resolution this year that is life-altering, that is life-changing. I'm going to pray in a few minutes, and I'm going to say a prayer. And if you don't know Christ today as your Savior, say the prayer with me. Let's start off 2017 with life change. For those of you that do, before I pray, I will be down up front and I'll have a couple other people. If you are struggling with something in your life and you are hungover, do not leave here today with it still on your plate. Bring it to the altar. Last service, I should have said something and I didn't, and I feel the same this service. There is a marriage in here today that is struggling, and you need to bring it and lay it at God's feet because He is the only thing that is going to heal that for you. He is the only thing that is going to make it right. Bring it to Him today. Quit playing. He knows the truth. Quit joking with everybody and with yourself. Bring it to Him today. Lay it at His feet and let Him fix it. That's the only way it's going to get right. If you're struggling, quit joking with everybody else. Be honest with yourself. That is where it starts today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross and shed His blood to cover my sins, Lord. God, I accept that gift today. I believe in who you are, and I believe in you. Lord, thank you for this gift. I ask you to come and live in my heart now and change my life. Start a new life and a new beginning and turn me over, God. Turn me into somebody who, who runs after you and chases you, Father. Thank you for all you have done and for giving me this opportunity. In your son's name I pray, amen. If you said that prayer with me today, let me see your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If there's anybody else that I can't see your hand, make sure you tell somebody. Make sure you let them know that God has created a new life in you and you have been changed. The Bible says that we are not afraid of our Savior. As the band plays, bring your stuff to the altar today. Don't leave with it. It's the only way.